My guest today is Carl Franklin. Carl, how are you, sir? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing great. It's good to see you again. It's been too long. It has been too long. Um, good to see you. I, I was thinking about, uh, I knew of you before I knew you. I knew you mostly from your podcasting. The, the, you, do a lot of, uh, you do a lot of different podcasts, but I knew you from the, the, the tech stuff, .NET yeah. Rocks and a few other things that uh, focus on programming. But you're a lot more than that, right? For one thing, you're an accomplished musician. I am, yeah. And I uh, by, I started my musical career when I was oh I don't know uh, one month old. No, um, uh, my musical career uh, isn't is kind of a misnomer because you know I'm, I've never been a professional musician. I never relied on doing music for for to make my living. But you know my brother and I started with piano lessons at four and five, and uh, my mother had us singing in the local. Uh, community chorus which we were doing great choral works in concerts when we were eight nice. uh, and nine respectively so my brother jay is a year older than me uh mm. so yeah we were i was a boy soprano when i was eight that that took me on a tour of england and scotland with the chorus the westerly chorus i did that us. yeah when i was uh 11 or 12 or something like that and uh then you know my my mother when we were old enough to demand electric guitars and guitar lessons and stuff she uh relented she wanted us to be classical musicians we had a lot of classical music in the house constantly mm -hmm. and uh so she was really hoping that we would go that route and we broke her heart by listening to rock and roll rock and all that steely <laughs> down corrupted your brain oh well, you know first was the beatles i think the beatles was the first real you know rock that we heard and then of course from there that led us down the rabbit hole to everything else but yeah so uh, i think i started guitar lessons when i was 12 and uh jay stayed with piano and i moved to guitar but you know he's one of these guys who just would love to play uh, any instrument that was in the house mm -hmm. so when he and i were in sixth grade or i was in fifth grade and he was in fifth grade we started with instruments like band instruments and his was oboe and mine was trumpet so he would always just pick up my trumpet and play what i played and get the guitar was the same thing like he picked up the guitar he just watched while the teacher was at our house teaching me stuff and he picked it up wow that's a talent and uh when we got to high school um he was playing electric bass in the marching band which is weird because, you know, he, he would stand on the sidelines with his bass and his shades. Uh. He was really cool, you know. <laughs> and he got docked once for bopping across the line because he's right on the sideline. And if any musician steps out of the line, uh, you know, off the field, they get docked. But he was like bopping his left foot. <laughs> would go point, point, point. But anyway, um, he stopped that and picked up uh, trumpet, and uh, my trumpet. And I moved to baritone horn, and it didn't go in that order. I, I started playing baritone horn, and he's like, Meh, I'll pick up the trumpet. And he just started playing, and he got the second trumpet. <laughs> Man. So anyway, my brother's a very, very talented musician as well. Uh, yeah, well, I've heard some of your work. It's pretty. It's good stuff. It's not just rock and roll. It's some blues no. and jazz and even some ambient stuff he recorded and released. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I'm struck by the fact that uh, it's not just you. There's a lot of... My perception is that there are a lot of software developers who are also good musicians. There seems to be a correlation. Uh, I, by the way, I, I defy that correlation. I listen to a lot of music, <laughs> but I do not play an instrument. Uh, but, uh, but first of all, do you agree with that statement, that there's, a, there's some sort of correlation between being a good developer and being a good musician? Yeah, I agree. I would say it a little differently. I would say that um, you don't have to be a good musician to okay. for for that for you to be a good developer. And you certainly, uh, I mean, there are certainly some who are exceptional musicians, but I know some really good developers who just, you know, are average music. I mean, I wouldn't call them average to their face, but, you know, they, they don't, they, they play a few chords and they like to sing a few tunes, but, you know, they, they don't uh, pursue it, you know, they don't practice for hours a day. Right. But yeah, I totally agree with that sentiment. There is something about 
being a musician and practicing an instrument, I think in particular, that lends itself well to the same sort of skills that you use um, as a developer. Uh, and I do have some thoughts on why, if you want me to. I'd love to hear. In fact, it's to me, it sounds a little bit counterintuitive. You know, music is an art. Computer science is a science. You know, music is very much an emotional thing. Uh, yeah. Computer science seems to be more rational. It's a, it, on the surface, it doesn't really make sense. Yeah, but, you're uh, right. But I think that there is something that both of these uh, have in common if you think about the realm of the mind. Because um, both software and music are abstract ideas. And the, the developer, the musician, needs to be able to hold an abstract model, sometimes a very complex abstract model, in, in the mind. Uh, let's talk about development, which should be obvious to everybody else. I mean, software exists in your brain. It, it exists in your mind. And you have to have a mental model of where things are. You also have to have a sense of the presentation, the, the end product. Right. Like, a, like a, a piano player has to, you know, perform a piece. Um, the end product for a piano player is the music that they pr create. Uh, the end product for a software developer is an application or you know some problem that was solved with code. But uh, both of those things are achieved by um, abstractions, right? I mean, when you're working with an object, there really isn't a solid object. Right. You know, it's a uh, it's it's, a a, it's yeah, it's a metaphor. It's an idea, and it maps to something in your mind that you can understand, but the real manipulation of these things happens in the mind and then you express that through code so that it can work out, right? And, and that's the same kind of thing that somebody practicing piano does. But there's also another thing that you can go a little bit deeper than just the idea of abstractions. Um, the idea of being able to quickly zoom out to look at the whole piece or yeah. the whole application, and then zoom in on these really technical details. You know, as a developer, uh, somebody said, you know, give me a feature that does X. Okay, well, you start it when they click the button, and then you r go into this code, and then you might actually have to get down into some really dirty details. Right. And then, you know, the, the piano player is reading uh, the source code, uh, the music, and they, uh, in order to nail this one part, they may have to practice those technical pieces over and over again. They may have to do scales. Like, they may have to practice scales to give their fingers muscle memory. And they may have to go very technical. But at the end of the day, they're presenting something that is, that is, a, that is a piece. You know, you could call it a work of art. You could call software a work of art. Um, it, it exists in the mind, and therefore, it's the same kind of thing to me. Yeah, that's a, that's a skill that I think is, I don't know if it's a requirement for software development, but it's definitely an advantage, this ability to look at the big picture and think about the architecture of an application, as well as uh, zooming in and you know, focusing right. on the details that actually make it work. And I guess yeah. uh, um, if I were a musician, then the notes are only part of what I'm doing. It's, it's really... I'm building something. I'm building something that wants to move people and make them feel emotions. Right. And also you have the concept of time, right? Rhythm. Okay. Notes over time or notes in a, you know, a, with the time intervals between them. Okay. Um, that's also an aspect of music and software as well. And you know as, as well as I do that if you present something too fast to the user and it just blips away then it, you haven't communicated effectively right so you, you're you're programming your application to communicate through visual uh and maybe auditory uh or or other means uh and so the concept of time is just as important in um in in programming That's now why if you I combine the turbo two button on my on my computer to press that <laughs> it's going too fast yeah right yeah you remember those the turbo xt the <laughs> There wasn't such a thing as, um, well, we used to write applications and games in particular that just used the system clock. Yeah, and when it got too fast, all of a sudden, it didn't work anymore. <laughs> right, and so you could get a faster processor and turn it down so that your games yeah. would work at normal speed. 
Oh, that boy. Was, yeah, that was an old guy joke. Oh, <laughs> definitely. Uh, I think um, one of the things that I, I think about is uh, both software development and uh, music. They're a, kind of a strange combination of working individually and working with other people. You know, yeah. A lot of a lot of software developers are introverts and they like, you know, kind of being locked in a room. It's sort of the stereotype. You right. Slide the pizzas under the door and let them do right. their thing. Uh, but there are users and there are people yeah. that are going to use your software and there are other developers that we collaborate with. And I, I think there's sort of a similar dynamic among musicians. Oh, absolutely. I mean, playing in a band versus working on a team. I mean, you're basically collaborating and you're trying to communicate those abstract ideas from one brain to another. Right. Using using uh, either music. Well, we we talk about music, you know, when we're playing in a band, and we're rehearsing. You know, what is that chord there? Oh, it's a C sharp minor with a flat five. Um, what is you know what are we doing here? Oh, when this guy says hi, then you get control, and then you do this. I mean, we we still have to talk to each other in English, um, even even though these abstractions are complex. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think um, musicians and developers are using the same parts of their brain? Is that I do. Uh, uh, so yeah, I do. So there's a, there's a is there a common aptitude then? If if you're good at or uh, if you're passionate about one or good at one, would would you think they're, they're likely to go together? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, absolutely. I would encourage any developer who is good at manipulating those abstract ideas. In other words, being a good developer to take up an instrument. Uh, you know, the the only problem there is that, especially for older people like us, your time is limited. You know, yeah. and that's that's why we encourage our kids to. I don't mean we, my my family and I, but you know, we all encourage kids to take up an instrument because they have the time to put into it. Mm. Unfortunately, for many, um, they get frustrated. Yeah, too early and drop out and not seeing the the end of the road which is to be able to just allow your fingers to move by themselves i think it's what you're really doing when you practice is you're 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 creating muscle memory and so you're you're thinking when you're practicing yes but if you you know if you're not um how should i say if you're just learning there's a lot of thinking and you might think to yourself, "Oh well, that person who's you know Eddie Van Halen or whatever uh, doesn't it look like he's thinking too much? He must be a genius. I'm never going to do that because I think uh -huh. when I play. Well, yeah, that's because you're practicing. But it, the more you practice, and the more you screw up when you practice and correct it, <laughs> then uh, you're going to wake up one day and your fingers are going to do it all for you, and then you just feel." And then, you know, magic happens. It really does feel like magic. But I, it's, very, it's a real shame that people give up before they experience that. Mm. Uh, well, because it is a lot of work. It is. Uh, it takes time. The, uh, the, the Malcolm Gladwell identified 10,000 hours yeah. is the key amount of time. That's a heck of a lot of time. That's, That's <laughs> a lot of time, yeah. Basically five years full-time, 40 hours a week. But think about it, though. A developer has the um, has the advantage of being able to understand music you know because it is an abstraction yes it's another language but uh, that's all it is mm -hmm. uh do you think uh, I, I do hear about developer musicians moving into software development but I don't, I don't often hear about software developers moving into music does that happen or um yeah i mean it can you know it, I, like i said it, it, it's a challenge because especially for older people that, uh, and I don't mean old people, older, older than children, right. who have careers, people who have careers and lives that, uh, you know, it, yeah, that it takes, but, but here's the thing too, is just, just get a guitar, borrow a guitar, learn one chord and sit with it and just play that chord and feel the vibration of the instrument and just the feedback that you get, it, uh, you don't have to be brilliant you know just that feedback that you get immediately yeah. is uh is some instant gratification and that in and of itself is valuable and with the piano with the same way i mean if you learn a few chords and then you're learning another song and another song and and it feels strange but you just keep going anyway um that, yeah that's that's what it's all about i love just playing 
chords on a piano. It doesn't matter what they are. I have mm-hmm. a I have a palette of chords that I can go to and and phrases and just to sit down and daydream with them. It's just mm-hmm. a wonderful wonderful thing. But uh yeah, I think that it's it's there's more people that started out with music and then got into programming and that is absolutely true. Um I was mentoring a kid, a high school kid who wanted to be in the studio business, you know. This was uh I don't know, 5 6 years ago. He wanted to intern at my studio. Mm. And I told him right away. I said, "You know, there probably aren't a lot of studio jobs out there. In fact, all the studios are closing and everybody has a home studio and therefore they just work on their th- stuff themselves." Mm. So it's not really a good career choice. However, um, if you want to, if you want to take the internship, I'll gladly teach you everything I know. And he said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, great, great." And I did work with him, and I worked with him, and all that. And then, at cer- at a certain point, I sat down and said, "All right, have you ever considered coding? Have you ever considered programming?" He goes, "No." And I said, "Well, do you like games?" "Yeah." How would you like to be able to create a game in four hours, like a a space shooter game? Yeah, he says. So I found this uh, Unity kind of uh, walkthrough with Unity 3D Mm -hmm. where you could, and it had all the graphical assets and stuff, and you just wired things up and you made a game. And I said, here, go through this. I'm going to sit here, you know, read my paper or whatever. And, you know, he spent four hours at the computer and he just loved it nice and then his his parents came in at the end and said what kind of studio what kind of jobs do you think i mean are you hiring what kind of job and i gave them the same speech and i said look you know this this is a hard business there are the only studios that are left are the the studios like in major cities and there's maybe two or three of them in every major city and Mm -hmm. you know everybody and their brother wants to get in there and work so the competition is fierce you know, the clientele are like Grammy award winning artists. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. even 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 people that you've heard of all your life, like James Taylor, is recording albums at home now. Like everybody's doing that. Is that because of the pandemic or is that uh no, this a is a general ha- trend? General trend. I mean, really good gear got very cheap and afford and uh, very affordable. Sure. Right. And you didn't have to have a lot of space all of a sudden, like uh so if you had an extra room in your house, you know, if you're James Taylor, you got an extra house, but <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It, yeah, it's like it, it got vi- isn't important to James, but it is to all these people coming up. Yeah. Plus, games. right. Plus the whole idea of just, you know, it, it's right there whenever you want to record something. Mm-hmm. So, so anyway, and his parents were kind of taken aback and, and at the same time I had lined up, uh, some, uh, I had lined up free tuition for, um, you know, like a boot camp type place. That was like a nine week intensive boot camp, And I got this free tuition because they advertised on .NET rocks and that was the swap. Well, I got that for somebody in the family and that person decided not to, not to do it. They didn't like programming after they couldn't take the whole, uh, wow. prerequisite stuff. So you and gave whatever. it to this kid. So I gave it to this kid and I said, nice. I said, if you want it, I'm offering this. And they were like, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> and it was just like, I want to smack them. Yeah. I was like, look, look <laughs> this is going to be fantastic. Trust me. And, and, you know, it's a real career with a real paying job and he'll be really in demand and he'll be able to make enough money to satisfy his music um, cravings like I do. And uh, so they went for it. And he graduated. Um, I saw the final presentation. He was very, very good, very confident. He understood it all. And as soon as he got back, he got a job at a local place uh, running their IT. And he's, oh, wow. going, he's going gangbusters now. That's, a, that's a strong evidence that uh, Absolutely. in one field is applicable to something else. And, uh, and maybe that's one of the reasons why people are moving more likely to move from music into software because it's right. a more stable profession. Yes. That's why I did it. Yeah. Um, 
Very cool. This is, uh, and I know uh, one last thing I wanted to ask you about is um, in your music, you actually are very technical in your music. Like you, uh, you own a studio, yeah, and you produce a lot of the music you do, and you, mm-hmm. um, and I think you also produce. You're responsible for the audio and all these podcasts that you're involved yeah. in as well. Right. Is that uh, tell me a little about that? Sure. Um, well, uh, are you you mean the audio and the podcasts? Oh, are they? Is it a different dynamic then when you're? Well, it has a history. Podcast versus versus producing music. Yeah, I think so. I mean, when you're producing music, you you do have to have people uh, singing in isolation. You know, all the tracks have to be isolated, um, and so for that, you I wouldn't. You know, I have a grand piano in the same room as a drum set, and I wouldn't have the two of them playing together mm. um, because you don't want bleed. And any time that I've had an instrument out in the room, you know, like a saxophone or something like that, and a drummer playing at the same time, it, you lose control because the drummer needs to have more definition when you turn that up. The saxophone sounds weird. Mm. So, so for example, so isolation is a concept that goes from recording studio to podcasts. As you know, you know, you've probably heard a lot of podcasts where somebody takes a recorder and puts it in the room, you know, on the table between two people. And when you listen to it, it sounds like they're in a bathroom, you right. know, whereas, you know, the, the pandemic actually helps because we can use tools like teams and we can use Zencaster and, and all these other, you know, um, uh, audacity to record ourselves in isolation and then put them together. Well, I, I've been doing that. I've been doing that with .NET Rock since 2002, um, where uh, we had people on the phone and calling in, and we could isolate them with a particular piece of hardware that only recorded their side of the phone. Mm-hmm. And then I had another guy who was in, you know, uh, Atlanta, and he was on the phone on another line, and you could bridge the two, and they could hear each other, and he's recording with himself with a microphone. And I'm recording with my microphone. And so we have now three discrete isolated tracks and right. we can sync them together. So that's, that's always how it works. And now, you know, with .NET Rocks and Richard and I, what we have been doing for years is just that. We would sync on Skype or the phone or something like that and I'd record that. And then he'd record a microphone, I'd record a microphone. The editor puts them together you know, takes the sync track out or mutes the sync track and it w- sounds like we're in the same room. Now we do that with a tool called Zencaster, Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R. And you do have to subscribe to it, but it's kind of like what you're using here, Teams. Yeah, that sounds exactly what I'm doing. Uh, well, almost. It has a, a, an added advantage. It's a web-based application, but it uses the web uh, audio API and video APIs, which are... Mm-hmm really have really gotten good in the last few years it uses that to every everybody records an mp3 on their local machine but they can talk to each other and they can see each other and you can even have it record video on the local machine and the person who starts the meeting has control over those as soon as you're done all the that stuff gets uploaded Oh, and nice. the person who starts it can just download all the individual MP3s. They're all in sync. Uh, and if you do MP4s as well, then you've now you've got isolated audio and video. And yeah, so that's a that's a really great tool. It didn't always work well, but I think I blame that more on you know the browser implementation of these APIs and I the see. APIs themselves that have just gotten so much better in the last three or four years. Uh, I need to check that out because I'm doing uh, the process is pretty similar, except mm. for when you say things like it automatically syncs them. That I have to do manually. You right. Have to clap ahead of time, and I have to line things up later on. Yep. Um, I could delegate that to my editor, if I had an editor. Yeah, I think using Zencaster would be a really good uh, thing for you. Is like I said, after when you just press the stop button, you have all the MP3s from every participant, and they're in sync. Very cool. Yeah. Well, Carl, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. And, Thank you, uh, David. It's, it's good to see you doing well. I know you were sick last year with COVID, and you, you look really good now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, and I hope to see you someday out there at another conference. Early next year, hopefully. Yep. All right. All right. Thanks a lot. You bet. Bye.
can pick your friends and you can pick your technology, but you can't pick your friends' technology. <laughs>